Tales of Terror and Mystery by Arthur Conan Doyle The Man with the Watches This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marta Kornowska Tales of Terror and Mystery by Arthur Conan Doyle The Man with the Watches there are many who will still bear in mind the singular circumstances which under the heading of the rugby mystery filled many columns of the daily press in the spring of the year 1892. Coming as it did at a period of exceptional dullness, it attracted perhaps rather more attention than it deserved, but it offered to the public that mixture of the whimsical and the tragic which is most stimulating to the popular imagination. Interest drooped, however, when after weeks of fruitless investigation it was found that no final explanation of the facts was forthcoming and the tragedy seemed from that time to the present to have finally taken its place in the dark catalogue of inexplicable and unexpected crimes. A recent communication, the authenticity of which appears to be a both question, has however thrown some new and clear light upon the matter. Before laying, it, before laying it before the public, it would be as well, perhaps, that I should refresh their memories as to the singular facts upon which this commentary is founded. These facts were briefly as follows. At five o'clock on the evening of the 18th of March, in the year already mentioned, a train left Euston Station for Manchester. It was a rainy, squally day, which grew wilder as it progressed, so it was by no means the weather in which anyone would travel who was not driven to do so by necessity. The train, however, is a favorite one among Manchester businessmen who are returning from town, for it does the journey in four hours and twenty minutes with only three stoppages upon the way. In spite of the inclement evening it was, therefore fairly well filled upon the occasion of which I speak. The guard of the train was a tried servant of the company, a man who had worked for twenty-two years without a blemish or complaint. His name was John Palmer. The station clock was upon the stroke of five, and the guard was about to give the customary signal to the engine driver when he observed two belated passengers hurrying down the platform. The one was an exceptionally tall man, dressed in a long black overcoat with astrakhan collar and calves. I have already said that the evening was an inclement one, and the tall traveller had the high, warm collar turned up to protect his throat against the bitter March wind. He appeared as far as the guard could judge, by so hurried an inspection, to be a man between fifty and sixty years of age, who had retained a good deal of the vigour and activity of his youth. In one hand he carried a brown leather gladstone bag. His companion was a lady, tall and erect, walking with a vigorous step, which outpaced the gentleman beside her. She wore a long, fawn-colored dust cloak, a black close-fitting toque, and a dark veil which concealed the greater part of her face. The two might very well have passed as father and daughter. They walked swiftly down the line of carriages, glancing in at the windows until the guard, John Palmer, overtook them. Now then, sir, look sharp, the train is going, said he. First class, the man answered. The guard turned the handle of the nearest door. In the carriage, which he had opened, there sat a small man with a cigar in his mouth. His appearance seemed to have impressed itself upon the guard's memory, for he was prepared afterwards to describe or to identify him. He was a man of 34 or 35 years of age, dressed in some grey material, sharp-nosed, alert, with a ruddy weather-beaten face and a small, closely cropped black bird. He glanced up as the door was opened. The tall man paused with his foot upon the step. This is a smoking compartment. The lady dislikes smoke, said he, looking round at the guard. All right, here you are, sir, said John Palmer. He slammed the door of the smoking carriage opened that of the next one, which was empty, and thrust the two travellers in. At the same moment, he sounded his whistle, and the wheels of the train began to move. The man with the cigar was at the window of his carriage, and said something to the guard as he rolled past him, 
but the words were lost in the bustle of the departure. Palmer stepped into the guard's van as it came up to him and thought no more of the incident. Twelve minutes after its departure, the train reached Wilsden Junction, where it stopped for a very short interval. An examination of the tickets has made it certain that no one either joined or left it at this time and no passenger was seen to alight upon the platform. At 5.14 the journey to Manchester was resumed and rugby was reached at 6.50, the express being five minutes late. At rugby the attention of the station officials was drawn to the fact that the door of one of the first class carriages was open. An examination of that compartment and of its neighbor disclosed a remarkable state of affairs. The smoking carriage in which the short, red-faced man with the black bird had been seen was now empty. Save for a half-smoked cigar, there was no trace whatever of its recent occupant. The door of this carriage was fastened. In the next compartment, to which attention had been originally drawn, there was no sign either of the gentleman with the astrakhan collar or of the young lady who accompanied him. All three passengers had disappeared. On the other hand, there was found upon the floor of this carriage, the one in which the tall traveller and the lady had been, a young man, fashionably dressed and of elegant appearance. He lay with his knees drawn up and his head resting against the farther door, an elbow upon either seat. A bullet had penetrated his heart and his death must have been instantaneous. No one had seen such a man enter the train, and no railway ticket was found in his pocket, neither were there any markings upon his linen, nor papers, nor personal property which might help to identify him. Who he was, whence he had come, and how he had met his end were each as great a mystery as what had occurred to the three people who had started an hour and a half before from Wilsden in those two compartments. I have said that there was no personal property which might help to identify him, but it is true that there was one peculiarity about this unknown young man which was much commented upon at the time. In his pockets were found no fewer than six valuable gold watches, three in the various pockets of his waistcoat, one in his ticket pocket and one in his breast pocket, and one small one set in a leather strap and fastened round his left wrist. The obvious explanation that the man was a pickpocket and that this was his plunder was discounted by the fact that all six were of American make and of a type which is rare in England. Three of them bore the mark of the Rochester watchmaking company. One was by Mason of Elmira, one was unmarked, and the small one which was highly jeweled and ornamented was from Tiffany of New York. The other contents of his pocket consisted of an ivory knife with a corkscrew by Rogers of Sheffield, a small circular mirror one inch in diameter, a readmission to sleep to the Lyceum Theater, a silver box full of Vesta matches, and a brown leather cigar case containing two cheroots, also two pounds fourteen shillings in money. It was clear then that whatever motives may have led to his death, robbery was not among them. As already mentioned, there were no markings upon the man's linen, which appeared to be new, and no tailor's name upon his coat. In appearance he was young, short, smooth-cheeked and delicately featured. One of his front teeth was conspicuously stopped with gold. On the discovery of the tragedy, an examination was instantly made of the tickets of all passengers and the number of the passengers themselves was counted. It was found that only three tickets were unaccounted for, corresponding to the three travelers who were missing. The express was then allowed to proceed, but a new guard was sent with it, and John Palmer was detained as a witness at rugby. The carriage which included the two compartments in question was uncoupled and sidetracked. Then, on the arrival of Inspector Vane of Scotland Yard and of Mr. Henderson, a detective in the service of the railway company, an exhaustive inquiry was made into all the circumstances. 
that the crime had been committed was certain. The bullet, which appeared to have come from a small pistol or revolver, had been fired from some little distance, as there was no scorching of the clothes. No weapon was found in the compartment, which finally disposed of the theory of suicide, nor was there any sign of the brown leather bag which the guard had seen in the hand of the tall gentleman. A lady's parasol was found upon the rack, but no other trace was to be seen of the travelers in either of the sections. Apart from the crime, the question of how or why three passengers, one of them a lady, could get out of the train and one other get in during the unbroken run between Wilsden and Rugby was one which excited utmost curiosity among the general public and gave rise to much speculations in the London press. John Palmer, the guard, was able at the inquest to give some evidence which threw a little light upon the matter. There was a spot between Trink and Cheddington, according to his statement, where, on account of some repairs to the line, the train had for a few minutes slowed down to a pace not exceeding eight or ten miles an hour. At that place it might be possible for a man or even for an exceptionally active woman to have left the train without serious injury. It was true that a gang of plate layers was there and that they had seen nothing, but it was their custom to stand in the middle between the metals, and the open carriage door was upon the far side so that it was conceivable that someone might have alighted unseen, as the darkness would by that time be drawing in. A steep embankment would instantly screen anyone who sprang out from the observation of the navies. The guard also deposed that there was a good deal of movement upon the platform at Wilson Junction, and that though it was certain that no one had either joined or left the train there, it was still quite possible that some of the passengers might have changed unseen from one compartment to another. It was by no means uncommon for a gentleman to finish his cigar in a smoking carriage and then to change to a clearer atmosphere. Supposing that the man with the black bird had done so at Wilsden, and the half-smoked cigar upon the floor seemed to favor the supposition, he would naturally go into the nearest section which would bring him into the company of the two other actors in this drama. Thus the first stage of the affair might be surmised without any great breach of probability. But what the second stage had been, or how the final one had been arrived at, neither the guard nor the experienced detective officers could suggest. A careful examination of the line between Walesden and Rugby resulted in one discovery which might or might not have a bearing upon the tragedy. Near Trink, at the very place where the train slowed down, there was found at the bottom of the embankment a small pocket testament, very shabby and worn. It was printed by the Bible Society of London and bore an inscription. From John to Alice, January the 13th, 1856, upon the flyleaf. Underneath was written, James, July the 14th, 1859, and beneath that again, Edward, November the 1st, 1869, all the entries being in the same handwriting. This was the only clue, if it could be called a clue, which the police obtained and the coroner's verdict of murder by a person or persons unknown, was the unsatisfactory ending of a singular case. Advertisements, rewards and inquiries proved equally fruitless and nothing could be found which was solid enough to form the basis for a profitable investigation. It would be a mistake, however, to suppose that no theories were formed to account for the facts. On the contrary, the press, both in England and in America, teemed with suggestions and suppositions, most of which were obviously absurd. The fact that the watches were of American make and some peculiarities in connection with the gold stopping of his front tooth appears to indicate that the deceased was a citizen of the United States, though his linen, clothes and boots were undoubtedly of British manufacture. It was surmised by some that he was concealed under the seat and that being discovered he was for some reason, possibly because he had overheard their guilty secrets, 
put to death by his fellow passengers. When coupled with generalities as to the fair city and cunning of anarchical and other secret societies, this theory sounded as plausible as any. The fact that he should be without a ticket would be consistent with the idea of concealment, and it was well known that women played a prominent part in the nihilistic propaganda. On the other hand, it was clear from the guard's statement that the man must have been hidden there before the others arrived, and how unlikely the coincidence that conspirators should stray exactly into the very compartment in which a spy was already concealed. Besides, this explanation ignored the man in the smoking carriage and gave no reason at all for his simultaneous disappearance. The police had little difficulty in showing that such a theory would not cover the facts, but they were unprepared in the absence of evidence to advance any alternative explanation. There was a letter in the Daily Gazette over the signature of a well-known criminal investigator which gave rise to considerable discussion at the time. He had formed a hypothesis which had at least ingenuity to recommend it, and I cannot do better than append it in his own words. Whatever may be the truth, said he, it must depend upon some bizarre and rare combination of events, so we need have no hesitation in postulating such events in our explanation. In the absence of data, we must abandon the analytic or scientific method of investigation, and must approach it in this synthetic fashion. In a word, instead of taking known events and deducing from them what has occurred, we must build up a fanciful explanation if it will only be consistent with known events. We can then test this explanation by any fresh facts which may arise. If they all fit into their places, the probability is that we are upon the right track and with each fresh fact this probability increases in a geometrical progression until the evidence becomes final and convincing. Now there is one most remarkable and suggestive fact which has not met with the attention which it deserves. There is a local train running through Harrow and King's Langley which is timed in such a way that the express must have overtaken it at or about the period when it is down its speed to 8 miles an hour on account of the repairs of the line. The two trains would at that time be traveling in the same direction at a similar rate of speed and upon parallel lines. It is within everyone's experience how, under such circumstances, the occupant of each carriage can see very plainly the passengers in the other carriages opposite to him. The lamps of the express had been lit at Wilsdin so that each compartment was brightly illuminated and most visible to an observer from outside. Now, the sequence of events as I reconstruct them would be after this fashion. This young man with the abnormal number of watches was alone in the carriage of the slow train. His ticket with his papers and gloves and other things was, we will suppose, on the seat beside him. He was probably an American and also probably a man of weak intellect. The excessive wearing of jewelry is an early symptom in some forms of mania. As he sat watching the carriages of the express which were on account of the state of the line going at the same pace as himself, he suddenly saw some people in it whom he knew. He will suppose for the sake of our theory that these people were a woman whom he loved and a man whom he hated, and who in return hated him. The young man was excitable and impulsive. He opened the door of his carriage, stepped from the footboard of the local train to the footboard of the express, opened the other door and made his way into the presence of these two people. The feet, on the supposition that the trains were going at the same pace, is by no means so perilous as it might appear. Having now got our young man without his ticket into the carriage in which the elder man and the young woman are traveling, it is not difficult to imagine that a violent scene ensued. It is possible that the pair were also Americans, which is the more probable as the man carried a weapon, an unusual thing in England. 
If our supposition of incipient mania is correct, the young man is likely to have assaulted the other. As the upshot of the quarrel, the elder man shot the intruder and then made his escape from the carriage, taking the young lady with him. We will suppose that all this happened very rapidly and that the train was still going at so slow a pace that it was not difficult for them to leave it. A woman might leave a train going at 8 miles an hour. As a matter of fact, we know that this woman did do so. And now we have to fit in the man in the smoking carriage, presuming that we have, up to this point, reconstructed the tragedy correctly, we shall find nothing in this other man to cause us to reconsider our conclusions. According to my theory, this man saw the young fellow cross from one train to the other, saw him open the door, heard the pistol shot, saw the two fugitives spring out onto the line, realized that murder had been done, and sprang out himself in pursuit. Why he has never been heard of since, whether he met his own death in the pursuit, or whether, as is more likely, he was made to realize that it was not the case for his interference, is a detail which we have at present no means of explaining. I acknowledge that there are some difficulties in the way. At first sight, it might seem improbable that at such a moment a murderer would burden himself in his flight with a brown leather bag. My answer is that he was well aware that if the bag were found his identity would be established. It was absolutely necessary for him to take it with him. My theory stands or falls upon one point, and I call upon the railway company to make strict inquiry as to whether a ticket was found and claimed in the local train through Harrow and King's Langley upon the 18th of March. If such a ticket were found, my case is proved. If not, my theory may still be the correct one, for it is conceivable either that he travelled without a ticket or that his ticket was lost. To this elaborate and plausible hypothesis, the answer of the police and of the company was first, that no such ticket was found, secondly, that the slow train would never run parallel to the express, and thirdly, that the local train had been stationary in King's Langley station when the express, going at 50 miles an hour, had flashed past it. So perished the only satisfying explanation, and five years have elapsed without supplying a new one. Now at last there comes a statement which covers all the facts and which must be regarded as authentic. It took the shape of a letter dated from New York and addressed to the same criminal investigator whose theory I have quoted. It is given here in extenso with the exception of the two opening paragraphs which are personal in their nature. You'll excuse me if I'm not very free with names. There's less reason now than there was five years ago when mother was still living. But for all that, I had rather cover up our tracks all I can. But I owe you an explanation, for if your idea of it was wrong, it was a mighty ingenious one all the same. I'll have to go back a little so as you may understand all about it. My people came from Bucks, England, and immigrated to the States in the early 50s. They settled in Rochester, in the state of New York, where my father ran a large dry goods store. There were only two sons, myself, James, and my brother, Edward. I was ten years older than my brother, and after my father died, I sort of took the place of a father to him, as an elder brother would. He was a bright, spirited boy, and just one of the most beautiful creatures that ever lived. But there was always a soft spot in him and it was like mold in cheese, for it spread and spread and nothing that you could do would stop it. Mother saw it, just as clearly as I did, but she went on spoiling him all the same, for he had such a way with him that you could refuse him nothing. I did all I could to hold him in, and he hated me for my pains. At last he fairly got his head, and nothing that we could do would stop him. He got off into New York and went rapidly from bed to worse. At first he was only fast, and then he was criminal. And then, at the end of a year or two, he was one of the most notorious young crooks in the city. He had formed a friendship with Sparrow McCoy, who was at the head of his profession as a banco steerer, green goodsman and general rascal. 
they took to card sharping and frequented some of the best hotels in New York. My brother was an excellent actor. He might have made an honest name for himself if he had chosen. And he would take the parts of a young Englishman of title, of a simple lad from the West, or of a college undergraduate, whichever suited Sparrow McCoy's purpose. And then one day he dressed himself as a girl, and he carried it off so well and made himself such a valuable decoy that it was their favorite game afterwards. They had made it right with Tammany and with the police, so it seemed as if nothing could ever stop them, for those were in the days before the Lexo Commission, and if you only had a pull, you could do pretty nearly everything you wanted. And nothing would have stopped them if they had only stuck to cards in New York, but they must needs come up Rochester Way and forge a name upon a check. It was my brother that did it, though everyone knew that it was under the influence of Sparrow McCoy. I bought up the check and a pretty sum it cost me. Then I went to my brother, laid it before him on the table, and swore to him that I would prosecute if he did not clear out of the country. At first he simply laughed. I could not prosecute, he said, without breaking our mother's heart, and he knew that I would not do that. I made him understand, however, that our mother's heart was being broken in any case, and that I had set firm on the point that I would rather see him in Rochester go than, than in a New York hotel. So at last he gave in, and he made me a solemn promise that he would see Sparrow McCoy no more, that he would go to Europe, and that he would turn his hand to any honest trade that I helped him to get. I took him down right away to an old family friend, Joe Wilson, who is an exporter of American watches and clocks, and I got him to give Edward an agency in London with a small salary and a 15% commission on all business. His manner and appearance were so good that he won the old man over at once, and within a week he was sent off to London with a case full of samples. It seemed to me that his business of the check had really given my brother a fright, and that there was some chance of his settling down into an honest line of life. My mother had spoken with him, and what she said had touched him, for she had always been the best of mothers to him, and he had been the greatest sorrow of her life. But I knew that this man Sparrow McCoy had a great influence over Edward, and my chance of keeping the land straight lay in breaking the connection between them. I had a friend in the New York detective force, and through him I kept a watch upon McCoy. When within a fortnight of my brother's sailing, I heard that McCoy had taken a bird in the Etruria, I was as certain as if he had told me that he was going over to England for the purpose of coaxing Edward back again into the ways that he had left. In an instant I had resolved to go also and to pit my influence against McCoy's. I knew it was a losing fight, but I thought and my mother thought that it was my duty. We passed the last night together in prayer for my success, and she gave me her own testament that my father had given her on the day of their marriage in the old country, so that I might always wear it next to my heart. I was a fellow traveler on the steamship with Sparrow McCoy, and at last I had the satisfaction of spoiling his little game for the voyage. The very first night I went into the smoking room and found him at the head of a card table with a half a dozen young fellows who were carrying their full purses and their empty skulls over to Europe. He was settling down for his harvest and a rich one it would have been. But I soon changed all that. Gentlemen, said I, are you aware whom you are playing with? What's that to you? You mind your own business, said he with an oath. Who is it anyway? asked one of the dudes. He's Sparrow McCoy, the most notorious card sharper in the States. Up he jumped with a bottle in his hand, but he remembered that he was under the flag of the effed old country where law and order run and Tammany has no pull. Gaul and the gallows wait for the violence and murder and there is no slipping out by the back door on board an ocean liner. Prove your words, you! said he. I will, said I. 
If you will turn up your right shirt sleeve to the shoulder, I will either prove my words or I will eat them. He turned white and said not a word. You see, I knew something of his ways, and I was aware of that part of the mechanism which he and all such sharpers use consists of an elastic down the arm with a clip just above the wrist. It is by means of this clip that they withdraw from their hands the cards which they do not want, while they substitute other cards from another hiding place. I recount on it being there, and it was. He cursed me, slunk out of the saloon, and was hardly seen again during the voyage. For once, at any rate, I got level with Mr. Sparrow McCoy. But he soon had his revenge upon me. For when it came to influencing my brother, he outweighed me every time. Edward had kept himself straight in London for the first few weeks and had done some business with his American watches, until this villain came across his path once more. I did my best, but the best was little enough. The next thing I heard, there had been a scandal at one of the North Cumberland Avenue hotels. A traveller had been fleeced of a large sum by two confederate card sharpers, and the matter was in the hands of Scotland Yard. The first I learned of it was in the evening paper, and I was at once certain that my brother and McCoy were back at their old games. I hurried at once to Edward's lodgings. They told me that he and a tall gentleman, whom I recognized as McCoy, had gone off together, and that he had left the lodgings and taken his things with him. The landlady had heard them give several directions to the cabman ending with Euston Station, and she had accidentally overheard the tall gentleman saying something about Manchester. She believed that that was their destination. A glance at the timetable showed me that the most likely train was at five, though there was another at four thirty-five, which they might have caught. I had only time to get the later one, but found no sign of them either at the depot or in the train. They must have gone on by the earlier one, so I determined to follow them to Manchester and search for them in the hotels there. One last appeal to my brother by all that he owed to my mother might even now be the salvation of him. My nerves were overstrung and I lit a cigar to steady them. At that moment, just as the train was moving off, the door of my compartment was flung open, and there were McCoy and my brother on the platform. They were both disguised and with good reason, for they knew that the London police were after them. McCoy had a great astrakhan collar drawn up so that only his eyes and nose were showing. My brother was dressed like a woman, with a black veil half down his face, but of course it did not deceive me for an instant nor would it have done so even if I had not known that he had often used such a dress before. I started up, and as I did so, McCoy recognized me. He said something. The conductor slammed the door, and they were shown into the next compartment. I tried to stop the train so as to follow them, but the wheels were already moving, at it, and it was too late. When we stopped at Wheelsden, I instantly changed my carriage, it appears that I was not seen to do so, which is not surprising, as the station was crowded with people. McCoy, of course, was expecting me, and he had spent the time between Euston and Wilsden in saying all he could to harden my brother's heart and set him against me. That is what I fancy, for I had never found him so impossible to soften or to move. I tried this way, and I tried that. I pictured his future in an English go. I described the sorrow of his mother when I came back with the news. I said everything to touch his heart, but all to no purpose. He sat there with a fixed sneer upon his handsome face, while every now and then Sparrow McCoy would throw in a taunt at me, or some word of encouragement to hold my brother to his resolutions. Why don't you run a Sunday school? he would say to me, and then in the same breath, he thinks you have no will of your own. He thinks you are just the baby brother and that he can lead you where he likes. He's only just finding out that you are a man as well as he. It was those words of his which set me talking bitterly. We had left Wales then. You understand, for all this took some time. 
My temper got the better of me, and for the first time in my life I let my brother see the rough side of me. Perhaps it would have been better had I done so earlier and more often. A man, said I, well, I'm glad to have your friend's assurance of it, for no one would suspect it to see you like a boarding school missy. I don't suppose in all this country there is a more contemptible looking creature than you are, as you sit there with the dolly pinafore upon you. He colored up at that, for he was a vain man and he winced from ridicule. It's only a dust cloak, he said, and he slipped it off. One has to throw the coppers off one cent, and I had no other way to do it. He took his stock off with the veil attached, and he put both in and the cloak into his brown bag. Anyway, I don't need to wear it until the conductor comes round, said he. Nor then either, said I, and taking the bag I slung it with all my force out of the window. Now, said I, you'll never make a Mary Jane of yourself while I can help it. If nothing but that disguise stands between you and the goal, then the goal you shall go. That was the way to manage him. I felt my advantage at once. His supple nature was one which yielded the roughness far more readily than, the, than to entreaty. He flushed with shame and his eyes filled with tears, but McCoy saw my advantage also and was determined that I should not pursue it. He's my part and you shall not bully him, he cried. He's my brother and you shall not ruin him, said I. I believe a spell of prison is the very best way of keeping you apart, and you shall have it, or it will be no fault of mine. Oh, you would squeal, would you? He cried. In an instant he whipped out his revolver. I sprang for his hand, but saw that I was too late, and jumped aside. At the same instant he fired, and the bullet which would have struck me passed through the heart of my unfortunate brother. He dropped without a groan upon the floor of the compartment, and McCoy and I, equally horrified, knelt at each side of him, trying to bring back some signs of life. McCoy still held the loaded revolver in his hand, but his anger against me and my resentment towards him had both for the moment been swallowed up in this sudden tragedy. It was he who first realized the situation. The train was for some reason going very slowly at the moment, and he saw his opportunity for escape. In an instant he had the door open, but I was as quick as he, and jumping upon him the two of us fell off the footboard and rolled in each other's arms down a steep embankment. At the bottom I struck my head against a stone, and I remembered nothing more. When I came to myself, I was lying among some low bushes, not far from the railroad track, and somebody was baiting my head with a wet handkerchief. It was Sparrow McCoy. I guess I couldn't leave you, said he. I didn't want to have the blood of two of you on my hands in one day. You loved your brother, I've no doubt, but you didn't love him a cent more than I loved him, though you'll say that I took a queer way to show it. Anyhow, it seems a mighty empty word now that he's gone and I don't care a continental whether you give me over to the hangman or not. He had turned his ankle in the fall and there we sat, he with his useless foot and I with my throbbing head and we talked and talked until gradually my bitterness began to soften and to turn into something like sympathy. What was the use of revenging his death upon a man who was as much stricken by that death as I was. And then, as my wits gradually returned, I begin to realize also that I could do nothing against McCoy which would not recoil upon my mother and myself. How could we convict him without a full account of my brother's career being made public, the very thing which of all others we wished to avoid? It was really as much our interest as his to cover the matter up and from being an avenger of crime, I found myself changed to a conspirator against justice. The place in which we found ourselves was one of those pheasant preserves which are so common in the old country, and as we groped our way through it, 
I found myself consulting the slayer of my brother as to how far it would be possible to hush it up. I soon realized from what he said that unless there were some papers of which we knew nothing in my brother's pockets, there was really no possible means by which the police could identify him or learn how he had got there. His ticket was in McCoy's pocket, and so was the ticket for some baggage which they had left at the depot. Like most Americans, he had found it cheaper and easier to buy an outfit in London than to bring one from New York, so that all his linen and clothes were new and unmarked. The bag containing the dust cloak, which I had thrown out of the window, may have fallen among some bramble patch where it is still concealed, or may have been carried off by some tramp, or may have come into the possession of the police who kept the incident to themselves. Anyhow, I have seen nothing about it in the London papers. As to the watches, they were a selection from those which had been entrusted to him for business purposes. It may have been for the same business purposes that he was taking them to Manchester, but well, it's too late to enter into that. I don't blame the police for being at fault. I don't see how it could have been otherwise. There was just one little clue that might have followed up, but it was a small one. I mean that small circular mirror which was found in my brother's pocket. It isn't a very common thing for a young man to carry about with him, is it? But a gambler might have told you what such a mirror may mean to a card sharper. If you sit back a little from the table and lay the mirror face upwards upon your lap, you can see as you deal every card that you give to your adversary. It is not hard to say whether you see a man or raise him when you know his cards as well as your own. It was as much a part of Sharper's outfit as the elastic clip upon Sparrow's McCoy's arm. Taking that in connection with the recent frauds at the hotels, the police might have got hold of one end of the string. I don't think there is much more for me to explain. We got to a village called Amersham that night in the character of two gentlemen upon a walking tour and afterwards we made our way quietly to London, whence McCoy went on to Cairo and I returned to New York. My mother died six months afterwards, and I am glad to say that to the day of her death she never knew what happened. She was always under the delusion that Edward was earning an honest living in London, and I never had the heart to tell her the truth. He never wrote, but then he never did write it any time, so that made no difference. His name was the last upon her lips. There's just one other thing that I have to ask you, sir, and I should take it as a kind return for all this explanation, if you could do it for me. You remember the testament that was picked up. I always carried it in my inside pocket, and it must have come out in my fall. I value it very highly, for it was the family book with my birth and my brothers marked by my father in the beginning of it. I wish you would apply at the proper place and have it sent to me. It can be of no possible value to anyone else. If you address it to X Bessenus Library, Broadway, New York, it is sure to come to hand. End of the Man with the Watches by Arthur Conan Doyle Recording by Marta Kornowska